صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا أبا عبد الله الحسين السلام على الشيب الخضيب السلام على الجسم السليم السلام على الشفاه الذابلات يا غريب يا مظلوم كربلاء كربلاء يا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة صدق الله العلي العظيم وصدق رسوله الكريم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين Enlighten your hearts with a loud salat على محمد وآل محمد When speaking about the mission of Imam al Hussein alayhi afdhul salati wa salam and examining the objective that he set out to achieve on the day of Karbala, on the day of Ashura, it is very important and recommended to revisit the mission of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. And examine his characteristics, his personality, his morals, his ethics, his demeanor, his teachings. Yesterday we concluded by examining the holy hadith that the Prophet stated, Husaynun minni wa ana min Husayn. Tonight, inshallah ta'ala, we will start the same point that we ended yesterday by Husaynun minni. Husayn is from me, and I am from Husayn. And we're not, discuss- we're not examining this issue because it happens to be sort of uh, fashionable or trendy or controversial. No. And we're not in a state of defense for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Definitely not warding off those who unfortunately made their sole objective to tarnish the pristine image of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Every day, every month, you have to find some sort of article that insults Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. You probably heard about that short movie film that was produced probably two years ago, or let's call it a clip was produced in America and I've heard that people had to leave out of that film the middle of the film they left because of the low value production that it had they insulted Rasulullah subhanAllah every time I remember that film these unprofessional uneducated imbeciles they insulted Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam in the very same Areas that he was insulted in the beginning of the time of announcing his prophethood, subhanAllah. Now then why are we discussing this issue? Because there is a deep connection between the mission of Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him, and the mission of Rasulullah, Khatim al-Anbiya, Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. (laughs) 
Seems like we're going to gather a lot of hasanat today because the whole topic will be mentioning the Prophet's name. So, Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. That deep connection, that relation between the mission of Sayyidi Mawlai al Hussein alayhi salam and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam is very deep. That for you to know what kind of mission that Abi Abdullah al Hussein accomplished and achieved in Karbala, you have to revisit the mission of Sayyidi Mawlai Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Now, the Prophet. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam descends down from the cave of Hira, Gharu Hira, and he announces his prophethood. 23 years after, later, he ascends to the pulpit on the day event of Ghadir, and he bids his nation farewell. Now between these 23 years, between these descent and that ascend, 23 years, what did Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam did to this nation? Now it's very important when referring back to the Prophet, we need to, brothers and sisters, show some respect. Even though when speaking with non-Muslims, we cannot refer back to the Prophet by mentioning his first name. Be careful. He's not our friend. Okay? Even the holy verse, when it reveals on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, Fatima tu Zahra, the very daughter of Rasulullah, starts saying, the messenger of Allah. Rasulullah looked back to her. She's like, Fatima, you are my daughter. I need you to call me, oh father. She said, no, Ya Rasulullah. You are an exception. She's like, no, Ya Rasulullah. I have to call you. I have to address you by saying, Ya Rasulullah. When referring back to the Prophet, you have to say, the Prophet of Allah, the Prophet, the, the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet of mercy and compassion and Rasulullah Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now what did Rasulullah do? 23 years old? He turned that nation, those nomadic, tribal, pagans, that their economy that time revolved under war and bloodshed. The way the life system of those nations back, Quraysh and Aus and Khazraj, these people, they used to invade villages, kill children, seize their product and assets and treasures, steal whatever they can steal, enslave women, and then go back. And as a reprisal for this kind of revolution, they have to wait for another revolution as a reprisal. And then, yes, again, their children will be get killed, and they will steal their money, and so on and so forth. And that cycle continues like that. And that time there was only two classes, brothers and sisters. High class, that used to rule the nations, whether it's economy or religion. They used to tell them which idol they used to have to worship, and the way they have to pre perform their worship, and so on, even though to economy. They exploit these poor by usury. They offer them loans, high interest loans, that after a while, let's say a year after, that interest compiles to a level that there's no, no, no sense to that poor to pay it back because it's double the amount of the actual balance that they got the loan for. So they have to give their children to those high classes. They practice it fanticide, female, female fanticide. Why? Because as we said, the whole economy system revolved under what? War and bloodshed. A boy can fight, a female can't fight, a girl can't fight. So they used to bury their females. One of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, after, after joining Islam, he says that I still feel wonder 
when I remember two things, the time of ignorance before Islam. They told him what? He's like, number one, how did I have, how did I have the audacity to bury my own daughter? And number two, is that when we used to hung be hungry, when we used to feel hungry, we used to eat our gods. Because they used to make gods made of idols, made of what? Dates. As soon as that companion, he becomes successor by the way as well, that companion used to get hungry, he used to eat his gods. Okay, the dates. And that narration states that while he was burying his own daughter, she grabbed his beard and he slapped her on her hand and he buried that daughter. Until Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam came to this nation and saved it. Fatima to Zahra alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam says, Kuntum taqtaduna al-qidda wa tashrabuna al-wadaq. You know what is that? I warn you, it's very disgusting. Kuntum taqtaduna al-qidda wa tashrabuna al-wadaq. You know what is that? I warn you, it's very disgusting. You used to eat, Sayyidah Zahra alayhi wa sallam says, my, my, my father came and saved you from, from the brink of extinction. You used to eat camel hair dipped in blood. And it, as exotic as to that, to that uh, food, you used to drink camel urine. Rasulullah, the Prophet Muhammad came and saved you. From the brink of extinction. They say that the British, they justify their occultation to New Zealand. Have you heard about that? They say that that time they were on the brink of extinction and they start eating each other. Human beings engaging in some sort of cannibalism. So we came and we offered them sheep because till now, till this very day, they say in New Zealand there's no, uh, a lot of the species of animal are not there, such as snakes and pests and all kinds of these insects. Till now we don't find them there. So we came and we offered them sheep. And afterwards, uh, they, they become uh, fine. But unfortunately, during that process, they had to kill roughly around like uh, hundreds of thousands of people. And now they say that uh, New Zealand has roughly around uh, 100 million sheep, something like that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam saved them from extinction. Kuntum taqtaduna al-wudda wa tashrabuna al-wadaq. The camel hair dipped in blood and the camel urine till Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to save you off of this. Now what did Rasulullah do to that level that people were ready to sacrifice their life for? They were ready to lay down their lives for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. They say one of the companions in the battle of Badr, he was dying, he was injured and he was passing away. They came to him, they told him, do you want to tell us something? He says, Dunakum wa hayatu Rasulullah. I sacrificed my life to Rasulullah. Now it's your time to sacrifice your life. What did Rasulullah do? What did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how can you make somebody love you to this extent? When Rasulullah performed Hajj, the only Hajj that he did in his life, he shaved his hair. The narration states that none of that hair touched the ground. They used to gather the hair of Rasulullah as a source of blessing. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, when he used to perform wudu, brothers and sisters, those who accused Rasulullah by saying that he had to resort to violent means to spread his religion, they should read these stories of Rasulullah. They should focus into history. When he used to perform wudu, not even a single drop of water used to touch the ground. Companion used to gather to gather that, to capture that water and keep it a source of blessing. What did he do to this Ummah? 23 years old, he flipped it, he overchanged the whole Ummah. A full change. 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam once wanted to perform cupping, what we call hujama. I warn you, this is a little disgusting. He wanted to perform hujama. So he called one of his companions, he told him, I need to do cupping. He did cupping for him and finished. Afterwards, it's recommended to look at the blood. He looked back, he told him, can I just take a look at the cup? I need to see the blood. He looked at the cup, it was empty. He told him, where is the blood? He told him, I drank it. Rasulullah told him, بِئْسَ مَا فَعَلْتِ You shouldn't do that. I know you love me, but you shouldn't drink blood. بِئْسَ مَا فَعَلْتِ But look what level they reached. They were so obsessed in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. What did he do? He used to invite people in good exhortation and wisdom. أَدْعُوا إِلَىٰ سَبِيلِ رَبِّكَ بِالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْمَوَاضَةِ الْحَسَنَةِ He was the prophet of mercy. He was the prophet of compassionate. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have not sent you only as mercy to this world. And people right now say that Rasulullah used violent means to spread out his religion. They should read that. Now, I need you to focus on two incidents. We're going to go through these two incidents. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he used to address people when he sits on the pulpit. He used to have lectures and speeches and so on. In this sort of a vast uh, communication way, sort of a way. But as well, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he used to invest some energy and time and exert some effort by guiding people individually, by themselves. He used to invest a lot of time in that. Not even... Not, sorry, just by ascending a pulpit and addressing people. By theirself. Just a conversation. One-to-one -one conversation. That explains that those who, those speakers, those blessed khutaba who ascend the mambar, sometimes uh, they tell them that our majlis has not more than, let's say, 10 to 20 attendees. That shouldn't be an, an indication for you to accept or not. You should accept right away whether you're well known or not. Because the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used to spend time with people one by one, conversations and time, it takes time. Safwan ibn Umayyah, this guy was a hatred to Rasulullah. He used to have a lot of hatred to Rasulullah. He wanted to ass assassinate the Prophet many times. He had several attempts to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. One day, he was sort of lazing around in the Haram al-Makki. And then he was condemning himself. He's like, this guy who descended, this orphan, the Yatim who ascended from the Ghar al-Hira announced, his prophethood and now he's ruling us, he's a king in Mecca. How come? He engaged in a battle of Badr and he killed 70 of us? What did he do? Why is that? We are the, the heads of Quraysh, how come? So his friend called Umran ibn Wahab told him, why are you so depressed? What's happening? He explained to him, he told him that this orphan is driving me crazy. I, I don't know what, what Rasulullah Muhammad is doing. He told him, do you want me to kill Rasulullah Muhammad? He told him, I wish if you can do that. He told him, no worry, I'll do that. But can you please take care of the loans that I have? My financial situation is a little... Uh, tricky and I need you to help me up. Can you just pay me, pay out the loans that I have? He told him, oh, for sure, I'll pay out the loans. I'll do whatever you need. I'll take care of your family. He told him, if I, went, if I go back there to Medina and let's say I, I lost my life there. You never know what happens. Can you at least take care of my family as well? He said, for sure, I'll do all that. Just go and take his life. And the chance is that even the son of Umran ibn Wahhab was a captive for the army of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So he said, I'll go there, I'll ask for my son, and I'll kill the Prophet. Umran ibn Wahhab heads to Medina. 
He reaches Medina. He enters. He wanted to speak to Rasulullah. They told him, okay, go ahead. He addresses Rasulullah and he tells him that, uh, I'm here to, uh, to free my son. I need you. I heard that you are the prophet of mercy and I need you to free my son. I need my son. He was hiding his sword under his robe. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam told him, Okay, I'll free your son. But can you tell me why do you have a sword? He, he, got, his he got puzzled. Uh, he said, uh, basically, uh, I was traveling from Mecca to Medina. And you know, you never know what happens. There's tribes and caravans and people who could... I could have easily engaged in any sort of battle. So uh, to protect myself... He told him, okay, can I ask you then, why did you dip that sword into poison? Because what he did back in Mecca, he dipped his sword into poison. He, he got astonished here. He's like, Muhammad, how did you know? How did you know that I dipped my sword in poison? You're talking like you were almost one of us there. You're the third party among, among that group. He told him, Ya Umran, do you want me to tell you about the loans that Safwan will pay you after you die? He said, this, there's no way. This is, this is total revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan rasulullah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Now Umran goes back to Medina. Safwan is... Accepting, expecting, sorry, uh, uh, Umran to come with the head of Rasulullah. He looked at him, he told him, look, I went, I met that guy. And I felt head over heels in love with this guy. And right now I am a Muslim. He's like, what? He's like, yes, I'm a Muslim. Ten years after, brother and sister, ten years, ten years later, sorry. What happens is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam goes back to where? To Mecca. As a king, right? And he enters Mecca that time. Uh, Khalid ibn al-Walid was among those companions. He starts chanting, Al-Yawm, Al-Yawm, Yawm al-Malhama. Al-Yawm, Tusba al-Hurama. Today is the day of the massacre. Today we will take your women as captives. We'll enslave your women. Rasulullah said, Ya Ali, Ya Ali, go and fix that. Go and correct his wrong. What is this guy saying? Then Amir al muminin the commander of faithful, Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him, stood up saying, Al-Yawmu, Yawmu al-Marhama. Today is the day of mercy. Al-Yawmu tuhma al-Hurama. Today we will save, we will protect your families and women. Safwan wanted to meet Rasulullah. He told him, Ya Amran, I'm wondering if you can just sort of manage a meeting. A I need to have this private dialogue with your Prophet. Do you think he will accept? He told him, I'll ask him. Amran goes to Rasulullah, tells him, Ya Rasulullah, Safwan wants to meet with you. He said, who? Safwan, the guy who wanted to assassinate me? He's like, yes. He told him, okay, for sure. He's welcome. How beautiful. Now you tell me that Rasulullah resorted to violent means. And he's luckily, kindly, accepting to have a conversation with his assassin. Amran goes back to Safwan. He tells him that Rasulullah accepted how lucky you are. He said, like, really? Okay, beautiful, let's go. And then he thinks for a while. He said, like, what if I enter that property and I see some companions of Rasulullah? They're definitely going to kill me. They're definitely because Rasulullah declared him. He wanted him. So he's wanted. Whether alive or dead. So he told him, okay, I'll go back to Rasulullah and I'll ask him about that. He, went, he goes back to Rasulullah, Umran. And he tells him, Ya Rasulullah. Safwan is saying that what if he enters and somebody kills him? Allahu Akbar. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam takes off his turban. And he gives it to Umran. He tells him, Ya Umran, take my turban and give it to Safwan. And as soon as my companion sees the turban in his hand, 
they will definitely do nothing to him. They will know that this is a means of protection to him. A guy who wants to kill you, you are giving, his, you are giving the most blessed Tajul Arab, you are giving the most blessed thing that you own, the Amama, the turban. Safwan takes that turban and he meets Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Long story short, he told him that I need you to give me two months so I can sort of ponder on these merits of this faith and I'll let you know, inshallah. It did not take him two months, brothers and sisters. A couple of days later, comes back to Rasulullah saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna ka Rasulullah. Rasulullah invited people through good, kind exhortation, mawaidah, hasana, and wisdom. Everybody knows that story that, that one of those people of the book, Ahlul Kitab, he used to bring his trash and dump it where? In the door of the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah got used to it. Right? And afterwards, one day, he sees no trash. It's like, that's weird. Maybe this guy got... Maybe he's busy or something. Another day, he misses that guy. He's like, this guy's not dumping the trash in front of my house. How come? He tells his companion, where's this guy? Is he okay? <clears throat> they tell him he is sick. How did Rasulullah respond? The Prophet of mercy, the Prophet of compassion... The Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said that I need to go and visit him and wish him recovery. Allahu Akbar. Now how, how can you not turn head over heels and love madly in love with such a person? Pure mercy, subhanAllah. And those who say that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had to actually resort to violent means so he can spread. Did they ever heard about that person that came to Rasulullah, one of the idolaters of Quraysh, Kuffar Quraysh. He enters to the property of Rasulullah and he grabs him from his clothes from here. And the narration states that he start bleeding. <coughs> People jump towards that guy to beat him up, definitely. Rasulullah gives a sign and tells them to control their self. And he took off his hand. He told him, what do you want? He told him, Ya Muhammad, the way they used to address Rasulullah, Allahu Akbar. Ya Muhammad, al-malu laysa maluka, al-malu malullah. That money is not yours, that money is belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give me some of it. He told him, for sure, I'll give you some of it. You're correct. That money is not mine. That money is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he orders one of the companion to give him money. And then he told him, hold on for a second. I just need to ask you a question. <clears throat> you entered my own property. Okay. You know I have friends, families, people are ready to protect me, companions, right? He said, yes. Then how do you dare? Where did you get this, this audacity from? To do that to me, to insult me in front of my friends. He told him, Ya Muhammad, I have heard, وَصَلَنِي أَنَّكَ لَا تُكَافِعُ السَّيِّئَ بِالسَّيِّئَ To that extent. He said that, I have heard, Ya Rasulullah, that you won't respond by any sort of bad manner for those, who for those who approach you with bad manners and matters. Allahu Akbar. Now how do we respond if somebody... Let's take the worst case. How do we respond if somebody punch you in the face? Are you going to tell them thank you? No, no you're not going to tell them thank you. But yes, Prophet of Rasul, the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, وَلَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Now why are we addressing all these? Why are we going through all these issues? Why do we study biographies, by the way? So we can derive lessons, no? Grab the teachings from their lives and implement them in our lives, brothers and sisters. Now let's, let's work on that. Let's not just sit there and talk and talk about Rasulullah without 
understanding that we have to derive these lessons, move these lessons, transfer them from the lives of the infallibles into our lives, have, have sort of a direct impact, brothers and sisters. And that's the practical step that we spoke about first night. الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا Those who admitted that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, admitted that the faith of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and embraced Islam. And then afterwards, they practically have steps. They showed that they are Muslims. إِن كُنْتُمْ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ تُحَبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي Follow me, yuhbibkum Allah. Beautiful is that. Wal-asri inna al-insana lafi khusr illa al-lazina amanu, have faith, wa amilu al-salihat. Now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam says, Man kana yuridu al-jannah أو actually he says من أراد الجنة فعليه بالإيمان ومن ولا يدرك الإيمان إلا إذا تحاببتم whoever wants to make his path towards paradise which means the goal the objective the sort of materialistic objective now when somebody asks you, what's, what's your goal in life? What's your, what's your objective in life? What do you respond? Saying Jannah? Do you, do you need paradise, brothers and sisters? Is that, is that, you? Is that your goal? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant us with paradise. But a true believer has to have in his, uh, inside that goal, which is reaching the satisfaction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now whoever wants to reach paradise, whoever wants to make his way through paradise, he has to what? Follow the faith. And you can never follow the faith unless if you love each other. It's Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now where are these people who are following the nation? Who are, where are these nations? Now this... This is why Al Imam Al Hussein alayhi afdhal salati was salam revolted to seek reformation for the religion of Rasulullah sallallahu to restore that's the right word if that's the correct word to restore the religion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi we explained yesterday what happened to the ummah in that time unfortunately Until Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, has to stand in front of these people, telling them, وَيْلَكُمْ يَا شِيَعَةَ أَهْلَ أَبِي سُفْيَانِ إِن كُنْتُمْ إِن لَمْ يَكُنْ لَكُمْ دِينَ If you had no religion, you don't believe in Allah. وَكُنْتُمْ لَا تَخَافُونَ الْمَعَادِ and you don't fear the hereafter and the day of judgment in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kunu ahraran fi dunyakum. Act like a free man. Don't act like slaves. Fortunately, Ummah is definitely slaves. All what they care about is like here you did shirk, here you did Buddha. Here you did shirk and here you did Buddha. All this Arabic spring that we heard about, afterwards, we all thought that they're going to manage that, the rule of their country. What they do is they demolish the shrines of the salihin, the righteous people. Subhanallah. It's like, why do you come to majalis? Why do you conduct these sort of uh, commemorations? This is Buddha. How come it's Buddha? Why do you celebrate the birth of Rasulullah? This is Buddha. You're introducing some false laws to the Islamic law of Rasulullah. I did not introduce nothing. We are gathering here to recite the Quran, to reflect upon the Quran, to ponder upon the Hadith of Ahlul Bayt. How beautiful is that? No, you celebrate the birth of the Prophet. Rasulullah never celebrated his own birth. Okay. Let me ask you this then. Rasulullah used to fast 
on the day, I'll mention this inshallah and we'll conclude. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had a sunnah, had a teaching, sort of a teaching. He said that you need to fast, it's recommended for you to fast on Monday. That's well known. A sunnah, Monday. In Kitab al Bukhari, says that a companion asked Rasulullah, why did you choose specifically Monday? He told him, because that is the day that I was born on. So Rasulullah apparently is celebrating his date of birth every, every week. Not every year, every week. Subhanallah. And he has, some, he has some special rituals as well. He's fasting, right? Like what is cel celebrating is remembering, right? Remembering. Rasulullah is remembering his date of birth on Monday. And he's actually having us to remember the day of his birth, which is Monday, and to fast. Now Rasulullah, yes, he did celebrate. Yeah, he did celebrate every week. Okay? And what's wrong? What's wrong when we, when we gather here and we recite the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ponder upon the ahadith and the narrations of Ahlul Bayt, the infallibles, and the ahadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. All what they care is, is about, unfortunately, this is Buddha and this is Shirk. Slaves! You already said it. Kuntum la takhafun Allah. If you seriously don't, just be, be free men. Have freedom. Act like human beings. They did not act like human beings. They killed the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Now all this is to know that why did Imam Hussein reform? Why did he revolt it? To reform these, these ideals, these characteristics, these methods, these demeanors, these akhlaq and ethics of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He made it very clear from the onset of his journey. إِنَّمَا خَرَجْتُ لِطَلَبْ لَمْ أَخْرُجْ أَشِرًا وَلَا بَطِرًا وَلَا ظَالِمًا وَلَا مُفْسِدًا إِنَّمَا خَرَجْتُ لِطَلَبِ الْإِصْلَاحِ فِي أُمَّةِ جَدِّي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ I have never come forth as an oppressor or somebody who wants to seek authority. No. I come forth seeking reformation in the nation of my grandfather Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Sallallahu I need to enjoin good المنكر, and forbid whatever is evil and I need to follow in the footsteps of my grandfather and my father Ali ibn Abi Talib Now just let me ask this question very fast Why did Imam Hussein say grandfather and father? Or do they have different roles? Why should he follow the footsteps of Rasulullah and Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib? That's, that's, that's a fine description here. Very briefly. Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, he protected this religion and he spread this religion based on explicit injunctions revealed upon him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He told him, Ya Ali, أُقَاتِلُوا عَلَى التَّنْزِيلِ وَتُقَاتِلُوا عَلَى التَّأْوِيلِ Okay? I protect this religion based on the explicit injunctions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because of that traditional revelation is not available in the era of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi of the salatu was salam. So Amir al-Mu'mineen protect the religion on the ta'wil, the application, deriving lessons, teachings from these injunctions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and implementing this ummah. This nation, brothers and sisters, that Rasulullah exert that effort, never appreciated nothing. And they left his holy body for three continuous days. The heat of the sun scorching that blessed body. 
Not even that. Rasul, the, the Imam, Imam Hussein alayhi afdhul salatu wa salam, his body narration states what says with no dress. You heard about that Jamal, that guy who used to lead the camels, that story, inshallah, we'll mention it later on. Not even this, the body of the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam was trampled under the hooves of the horses, brothers and sisters in the plain of Karbala. Maha kada li Rasulillah ya ummat al baghiyya jaza. Jazaru jazra al avahi naslahu thumma saqu ahlahu sawq al iba. This is not the way that you reward Rasulullah. This is not the correct way that you gift back Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. You slaughter his progeny the same way you slaughter animals. Jazaru jazar al awahi naslahu thumma saqu ahlahu sawq al Mahada li Rasulillah ya ummat al baghi jaza. I request if you can dim these lights if you don't mind, uh, so we can live the moments. Uh, today is a special night, brothers and sisters. Uh, this blessed night uh, is reserved to commemorate the time that the caravan of the holy progeny of Rasulullah reached Medina after Karbala, after Karbala. Al Imam Zayn al Abidim, peace be upon him, on the border of Medina, he sees a man, a blessed man called Bishr ibn Hazlam. He told him, Ya Bishr, Rahim Allah, Aba Kenahu Kan Shaira. May Allah send mercy on your father. He was a poet. Hal to ji the shayan min al-shair. Do you know how to recite or write poetry? He told him, Yes, Ibn Rasulullah, I am a poet as well. He told him, Then can you please head to Medina? Medina of the Prophet Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and he express the condolences and tell them that what happened in Karbala? He told him, Yes, Samhan wa ta'a Ibn Rasulullah. Uh, brothers and sisters, uh, Bishr ibn Hadlam reached Medina uh, and he started reciting uh, this beautiful poetry saying, and he stops. He says, Oh, people of Medina, this is not your place anymore. This is not your city. You have to leave. You have to abandon that city. Because Rasulullah left from that city. Hussein left from that city. Amir al Mumni left from that city. Hassan left. Why are you doing? What are you doing? This is not your place. And be careful, brothers. These are Arabs. When you talk to an Arab in this language, when you tell him that this is not your home, this is not your place. That's that's problematic to be honest. But he's telling them, Ya ahla ya thribala muqa malakum biha. And he stops. He's telling them, so then tell us why are you saying that? Why are you saying this is not our city anymore? He says, Al Khabar an the Qabri Rasulillah. Who wants the news? You want to know why? Follow me to the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Bishr ibn Hadlam, that blessed companion, reached the grave of Rasulullah and he continues the poetry. He says, Ya ahla yas, ribala muqa amalakum biha. Qutil al-Husayn, fadmu'i midraru. Husayn has died. الجسم مين وبكربلاء مضرج 
والرسمين وعلى القناة يدار and he explains he says the body of Abu Abdullah is left in the plains of Karbala and his blessed head his sacred holy head is on the spear on top of a spear spinning from a city to city al man Abu Karbala مضرجون والرأس من على القناة يدار الولان الصوت من الجمع الأكبر والله جد مرة تمشي وتعثر brothers and sisters while Bashir is sending these condolences he hears a voice a fainted voice of a lady saying Ya Bashir can you tell me if Hussein is alive or dead he got puzzled he's like what, what is this woman asking me about I'm sending condolences Anna al Hussein how weird is that? She never responds. She repeats. She's like, Ya Bishr, Akhbirni an al Hussein. Wahayun ammayyat. And then people told him, Ya Bishr, don't blame her. Inna um al banyan. The mother of the children. She had lost four children in Karbala. And then Bishr says, Then I wanted to tell her about what happened to her children, how, how they sacrificed their sacred lives towards Abi Abdullah al Hussein. And then he says, how did she respond? تقول لك كلهم فدا الحسين يرحيون. She tells him يا بيش I have never asked you to tell me nothing about جعفر. Neither Abdullah, neither Aun. Tell me about حسين. Is he alive or is he dead? And then he said, يا أم البنين عظم الله لك الأجر بولدك أم الفضل العباس. Narration states that she had a child on her shoulder as soon as she heard Abbas. That child. Down on the ground. Allah Allah jira jibe jaafar wa ani tigil na kilom vida lahsiyan yarhu. Tell me about Hassan. And then she replies back. She told him, "Ya Bishr, I'm not asking you about Jafar, nor Abdullah, nor Al Abbas. Tell me about Al Hussein. He's a human being." And then he surprised her. He said, "Allah, Allah, لك الأجر بأبي عبد الله الحسن أيوة سيدا أيوة أبا عبد الله. Then he informed her. He told him that Abi Abdullah Al Hussein is no longer in this life. Abi Abdullah Al Hussein's soul has ascended to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. من منشد الزهراء بضعة أحمد قضى شلوها ضامن بصارم ملحدي أسل دمعك القاني وقل متأسفا يقضي ضمان صبت النبي بكربلاء وفي كل عضو من أنام لي